there are countless books, white papers, blog posts, workshops and TED Talks about building a community, all offering complex models and guidelines. A strong and cohesive community is pretty simple. It's just bringing together people with similar interests and challenges to learn, connect and serve for the good of themselves and others. Communities that make a difference understand the chances one gives are just as important as the chances one takes. That's why CEO.com clubs exist to give and take chances on ourselves and others. CEO.com clubs are exclusive, invite-only communities that connect visionary leaders based on specific challenges, industry focus and leadership goals. We do this in various ways, including providing a private social network for community members only, highly curated leadership events, access to our member directory and, well, you get the idea. You can learn all about the array of benefits at ceo.com slash clubs. More than anything, what ceo.com clubs uniquely do better than anyone else is bringing leaders with similar interests and challenges together to ask each other the following two questions. How can I help you? And how can we give a chance to someone else? If you're a leader in a specific industry who wants to give and take chances on yourself and others, CEO.com has a club for you. Life is more gratifying and full of purpose when you become someone who gives as many chances as you take. You also have to be in a business you care about, you're passionate about, yeah. that you love. I think way too often there's a CEO who's not a good fit for what they're running. They might be a great CEO. Do the values match them? And does the company's product or service match them? And I think some CEOs that maybe would perform, but those two things don't match up. They're not as good as they could be. So I took the time to think, okay, what are the values that are authentic to me? Mm -hmm. And what is a business that I'm really passionate about? What's it like being CEO again? Being in the big captain's chair once again, back in the mix. Um, you sold your company for a ton. Yeah. You don't have to do this yeah. at all. Yeah. But now you're building this incredible company. Yeah. Um, there is something extraordinary in life about having a bigger pursuit than yourself and having something to look forward to, to the point where something that I think entrepreneurs are really fortunate to have is this feeling when you wake up of just pure excitement for life and what you're getting to pursue. And so sometimes I just feel like entrepreneurship can almost be cheating and living in life because of the excitement. Uh, and I think at moments I took that for granted, Clint, mm -hmm. because I'd been in it for so long. And then when I was out of it, I started doing things that were like thrill-seeking type things. And I realized the reason I did it is I'd been at such a high level mm -hmm. of adrenaline for so long. And I enjoyed it so much that I didn't realize how fortunate I was until I didn't, I wasn't doing it. And uh, tell us about the company. Okay, so um, one thing that I, I think, Clint, is really important to be a um, high-performing CEO is not only to uh, identify with the values of the business, and they have to really, you have to exude them, they have to be a part of you. Mm -hmm. You also have to be in a business you care about you're passionate about, yeah. that you love. I think way too often there's a CEO who's not a good fit for what they're running. They might be a great CEO. Do the values match them? And does the company's product or service match them? And I think some CEOs that maybe would perform, but those two things don't match up. They're not as good as they could be. So I took the time to think, okay, what are the values that are authentic to me? Mm -hmm. And what is a business that I'm really passionate about? I'll give you two kind of reasons why I felt like full cast would be the right. Mm -hmm. um, in 2005, when I was kind of beginning my tech career and was at Direct Point, there was this developer um, named Shelly Warren. And I was working with her and we were using Sugar CRM and we would geek out and go deep with we, we built um we built like spiff on yeah. sugar crm we built insidesales.com on and built the dialer we built forecasting tools that like clary there's these huge billion dollar companies now but we built that all in sugar 
her and I, and we would just like jam till you know late at night and we're building things. And I'm like, why am I so nerdy that I think sitting here building this software at seven o'clock at night is like way cooler than anything else I could be doing. And so having that experience and looking back, having the time to reflect and be like, what was I really enjoying? Mm -hmm. So that kind of that software around revenue operations, I was really enjoying. And then I go to work for what was at task that became Workfront. Mm -hmm. And me and Scott Johnson, we do this trip in 2008 to San Francisco. OpenView is the VC in Boston that's backing us. And because of OpenView, we had this connection to the president of sales at Salesforce at this point. We fly out, we spend the day, and we get to hang out with all the leadership at Salesforce, all the marketing leadership. They give us their own decks, how they're viewing things, how they do things. And I'm the whole day, I'm just glued. I'm like, this is so interesting to me and exciting. So I knew like revenue operations and that kind of that ecosystem and space is something I just yeah. naturally love and could geek out on. So I started looking for companies that were in that space of revenue operations software. And looking back, I'd had that passion for a long time. And so we started looking at different companies. And I looked at probably 50 companies. I knew I didn't want to start at zero. I was like, this zero to two million is, I have a lot of respect for any entrepreneur going zero to two million is treacherous it's hard. and it's hard unbelievably hard unbelievably hard yeah. doesn't get enough yeah. kind of respect <laughs> uh and so having been through it multiple times i was like if i could i will write the check to not go through that pain yeah to skip that part. just to skip that part <laughs> you have my money so i i knew i was looking for a company that had already gotten product market fit that was maybe at the series a level almost series B, mm -hmm. ready to scale. And what I noticed is there's a lot in revenue operations, there's all these companies that are focused on their primary user would be a salesperson or a sales manager. Mm. So it's software that would help them prospect better, software that would help them forecast better, software that would record their calls or coaching, everything for salespeople. But I did not see companies focused on the operations people that make all the sales and marketing professionals perform well and succeed. Mm -hmm. And Fullcast was the first company where I was like, oh my gosh, the head of revenue operations for Salesforce built the product for him, his people, revenue operations people, not the salespeople. Now, the salespeople and the sales leaders are a secondary kind of user but it's primarily for the ops people, the unsung heroes, the people mm -hmm. that when I text them between 10 and midnight, they reply in a heartbeat. They're the people that fulfill on what is sold, right? Exactly. And they're they're the ones that fulfill like Which is way harder. Way harder. And they're the <laughs> yeah, way harder. And they're the ones that the CEO will talk about uh, a big strategy or the board. And they're the ones that then have to go make it all happen. But mm -hmm. then who get when when quota gets hit. The CRO gets all the credit. Mm -hmm. You know, when when EBITDA is hit, the CFO gets credit. But the people that make the whole thing efficient and behind the scenes, they never get any credit, but they're the ones that are making it all work. Yeah. And so we wanted to build for them. And the only companies that had built for them historically uh, that we saw uh, were like Anaplan and Exactly. And those companies are now 20-year-old, antiquated mm -hmm. software. They're owned by big private equity and really, they were built for CFOs. And mm. then the revenue operations people were their afterthought upsell. It was like revenue operations for us, they're not going to be the afterthought. They are the thought. Yeah. And we're going to build for them. And we're going to go after the Anaplans and Exactly's and we're going to beat them. They've also validated these, you know, Anaplans a $10 billion market cap. Yeah. I want that market cap. Yeah. So I, I realized that it's a business that has a validated market cap, a business that's differentiated, and one we can really go after. And the other thing that I noticed is they had spent so much venture capital and money on the product. But when you looked at the sales team, they had one salesperson and one content marketer. That was their entire sales and marketing. Mm. They just didn't invest there. So in this last quarter, we just had a blowout quarter. And it was exceptional and because it's a great product with a lot of happy customers and we're putting the juice behind it. Uh, now it's happening. What's your sense for like state of the economy and how that'll affect what you're doing? 
it seems like operations is so critical that it, you're kind of a little bit recession proof in that. For, Whereas like a sales, a sales only one would go up and down depending on, cause you know, operations is interesting. What, what is your thought? For, Current for macroeconomic sure. environment. Uh, I mean, for sure. And we, one thing that's great about our sell is there's an efficiency cost cutting and there's a performance and sales increase. So we can go either way with our message and it's resonating. And the when you're delivering real value and you're focused as an entrepreneur, you're going to succeed in any environment. Now, maybe not as wildly, but you're going to succeed. I've always felt like you like paying attention to competitors. I'll see if there's a few people that are in a lot of our deals. I'll pay attention to them, but I stay heads down. The uh, the economy, again, I'll pay attention. I check in on it, but it's never an excuse. Mm -hmm. It's almost like for me, I'm like, let's lock in, let's win in any environment, and let's just adapt until we figure out how to succeed in whatever economy we're in. But that's more my mentality than I just don't ever want that to be a reason we're not. I will never send that email to investors saying, we're not succeeding because of uh, the economy. Maybe it's we're slower growing, but we're not going to not succeed. How much did you raise to buy the company? Can okay, you say so that? yeah, I can explain. Um, total breakdown. We actually um, one thing I love to do is under promise, over deliver. So we announced thirty four million, but we actually raised thirty six. So I know that's probably a little bit rare to announce less than you raise, but I always love to give a little bit of like even when I talk about our revenues. Everything will always be less than reality. Mm -hmm. um, I just found that like almost everything in life with investors and everyone, customers is under promise, yeah. over deliver. It just works so well. So much of life is expectation setting. But the revenue side, we as founders, we put in nine million. We were the largest investors in the round. Um, we we maintain a majority. Um, we uh, have one investor as a board seat. Founders have three board seats. We set the company up right for the long term to build a public company, which is ultimately yeah. what I want to accomplish. Um, so 36 in total, nine from the founders. You realize that's an absurd number, right? Like to it's raise $36 million, <laughs> particularly in the environment that you raise it in, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I, I, You know, one of the things that has been great is our team, all of us together, have been working hard at this and building businesses for a long time. And I think that because we've delivered on uh, what we've said we'll do time and time again, we've driven returns for our investors, uh, even in any environment, as long as you keep your word, mm -hmm. you deliver, and you do it in the timeline you say you will, you'll be able to raise money. And so I was a beneficiary of just time and a great team. And the founders are you? Yep. Uh, Me, Cook. Amy. Isaac and Westwood. Brother. And Lance Evanson. Okay. Very cool. Um, who do you like, who do you prefer to take money from? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, one thing that I do in almost every area of business is those, those relationships are precious. And who you take that money from is important. I do not, I'm never reactive in who I take that money. I've never had a situation where a bunch of feces threw in at the last minute and then I was trying to decide between them based on their valuations and everything else. I am very thoughtful. I would say that before um, taking money from someone, something happened 10 years earlier yeah. that started that. And I love to be able to watch people through lots of situations. And I, and I watch very closely over a long period of time yeah. before I involve them. And I think that if all entrepreneurs would think – Okay, have I known this person for five or more years? Have I seen them through ups and downs? And that means in the early days as an entrepreneur, you might bootstrap instead of raising money, which is what I did for a long, long time. And probably what you should do if you can. Yeah, and I learned, yeah, I learned a lot of discipline. I learned to watch cash flow daily. But I also watched people and then made very kind of strategic bets with investors that I knew um, worked in the community with or were around. And I take the same. So I take calls from investors all the time and not when I'm raising, but all the time. And I'll take lunches and dinners with them because the whole time I'm thinking at some point when I raise, I'm going to have in my head four or five people. Mm -hmm. And those are going to be the ones that kind of rise to the top. One thing about having this entrepreneurial family we have, you know, I, and I mentioned some of my co-founders, 
um, I wasn't the only one raising money. Like, for example, Amy uh, was like, okay, I'll raise $2 million. And she raised it from her own network because she's that good on her own. Yeah, she's um, awesome. Or, or same thing with Lance. He's like, hey, I'll, 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 uh, he's in Seattle. I'll bring in $2 million. So I have a strong enough team that in their own right, they could all raise seed rounds independent of me. And I think that's one of the major differences for us. Well, that's remarkable. That's another thing that's crazy, like, is how talented your founding team is. And the experiences you've had, you've known all of them for they're five, all 10, ten years, they're right? All, they've all worked with me or, or say, for yeah. 10 years yeah. or more, every one of them. It's incredible. I feel so fortunate. I think that startups are so hard. And the fact that they want to keep doing that with me is great. And the fact that every single one of them could raise that raise rounds without me is also uh, makes me very grateful that I get to work with all of them. Yeah, that's pretty wild. And so, who did what? Who did you ultimately decide you were going to take money from on this one? Kent Madsen, and he's our lead investor and board member. And I can I Epic can, Ventures, Epic Ventures, and him and Nick are phenomenal guys. Um, I'll tell you. I'll give you an example of how that relationship has developed over time. He invested in our business. Then I invested in the fund and became an LP. Then I helped him raise uh, money and brought in other LPs. Then I exited as a portfolio CEO. Then I was a venture partner for the fund. So if you think about the depth of our relationship, I've been able to add value for him and the fund in bringing in LPs, in bringing in deals, in being a port co CEO and exiting for them and driving returns. And so in every facet that I could impact their fund, I've been able to do that. And they've been able to do the same for me throughout every stage. And so when you develop a relationship like that, it, the the amount of you know good and things that you can accomplish when the relationships like that mm -hmm. is very different than just getting a check from that entrepreneur or that VC that flew in a week ago. Yeah, not the same thing. And then you you look in tough moments and you're trying to figure out decisions, and it's just a different headspace for everyone. I actually love this story, and it's probably worth uh, double clicking on. Uh, you were running this nonprofit. It, like it'd been around for like 30 years at the time. I think it was called Utah Valley Entrepreneur Forum. Yeah. And it was going through a transition and uh, you and I went in there. You were the chair of it. Yeah. I don't know what I was. You were I, like vice chair yeah. and you and I were, <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we were just doing it together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, you were the chair of it. And then it was me and you and everyone else was a VC yes. on the board. That's right. And it was all of the top VCs in the state of Utah. Yes. And what I love about that, like for me, I was just like, well, I just love Ryan. I'll do whatever he says. Thank you, Clark. And then I'm like looking at it and you're like, oh, like this, he's kind of vetting these VCs <laughs> around. Because we met like what, once a month or I, I can't remember what it was. And we held events and things like that. But really like what was interesting is you were building a personal relationship with each one of them. And it turns out like Kent comes out on top after that, um, you know, experience. And we were in a room with them a lot and saw them and how they interacted and how they thought a lot. It yeah. was really interesting. Yeah, we were emailing, dealing with them on a day to day, doing events. And um, I completely did that uh, because I was thinking, how do I develop those relationships long term? And uh, how can I be thoughtful? I knew we were going to raise a round. Well, within two years and two years after running, I resigned and then we raised the round. But I was doing that with that in mind. And I think that was one of the more, uh, I would say, creative ways when people ask me awesome. about raising money. I usually take in more creative ways. I never went in your standard, here's a deck, show up and pitch. In fact, I've never had a deck that I was just out pitching. Usually what happens is I would have the anchor investor in the term sheet signed and then they would say like, oh, hey, you know, email us a deck. And that's typically how it would go mm -hmm. is after most of the money was raised, then I would make a deck. Just a different way of fundraising. Yeah, and I think like once we were done with UVF. We just absorbed it into Silicon Slopes. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's like inside of this org now. <laughs> yeah. Just I don't know like, what that means. Well, everything's in better hands under Silicon Slopes. <laughs>
<laughs> so eventually good. it got absorbed into there. But I found that whole, uh, the whole way you think about raising money and the way that you approach it. And it's kind of like this serve, give first mentality. Like some people may see that and be like, oh, that's kind of like, uh, at, you know, maybe a way to like, I don't know. You know how people are. They critique everything. I see that and I was like, well, you just gave two years to the startup and tech and venture community. Um, and in exchange, you got to build these relationships. But that wasn't the point. The point was to give first and then you just kind of see what happens next. You, you have a really, that's kind of where you lead on everything. It's really fascinating. Well, uh, Clint. It's rare. It's so magical when you think that way because um, I, I was able to give back to these different entrepreneurs and I gained a lot. They gained a lot. But I take the same mentality with my team. We're very generous with the equity with all of them. Uh, we also have 1% of the company right away that we give to a foundation. So the whole time we're building, we know we're going to give to the community. We know that a lot of people are going to be millionaires that do what we do. Mm -hmm. And I have a spreadsheet that keeps track, and I've seen people online putting their number. I don't put my number publicly, but it's a good number. Mm -hmm. And I plan to expand on that you know, in a big way over the coming years. And when you wake up in the morning and you're not waking up for you to get data boys and for you to feel good about, you know, some type of recognition that'll wash over you in minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, when you wake up and you think, um, I know that by building this company, there's going to be a giant check to a charity. I know that by building this company, there's going to be first generation, you know, millionaires, all over the place. I know that this is going to impact a lot of people. And when you can think in your head of 20 stories where employees have sent you letters and said, you know, I just went through this terrible divorce. I was in major debt. Seven years forward at Simplest, I come out and I'm a millionaire and my life has changed and I'm remarried. And you're just like, that is why I do this. Yeah. And you you lose the magic of entrepreneurship if it's about you. If you're if you're trying to build for you, it's it's such a mirage. It's not the the greatest feeling. I remember um at our Sandy office, I remember Jeremy Andrus after he um, exited uh, one of the one of the exits with Traeger, and he was sitting on my couch, and he was like, you know, the feeling of because he, he, he actually cut out of the deal uh, money for a bunch of people, mm -hmm. and then he was able to watch that money be distributed at their you know surprise to their bank accounts, and as he told me the story, the twinkle in his eye was pure magic. Mm -hmm. Like the feeling that he had was had to have transcended what hit his bank account. Sure, a lot of money hit his bank account. But the reality is for all of us, there's only so much you can do with with that money yourself. There's mm -hmm. a there's a governor on it. I don't know how everyone else feels, but I think that that mentality of, of putting other people first and giving them opportunities, it just keeps winning for me. Yeah. Um and you took money from a lot of these folks that you're that you're kind of referencing, right? Like, oh uh, gosh, like yeah. These are the people like you want to take money from. Like you have your lead investor, and then you go and you reach out to these other successful entrepreneurs, right? Yeah, we actually had a problem where we have so many people now that have made so much money that we have to ask them to put in less, and then they're kind of like jockeying to hilarious. put in more money. And so, yeah, it's 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 kind of fascinating. And there are investors that reached out to me, a lot of them that I just said, hey, it's not going to work. And there were a few that said our valuation was too low, and every one of them are going to feel the pain of that decision. <laughs> I hate to say it, but they will. And the fact that they're still local and didn't believe in our team, maybe it's just me, Clint, but I'm stunned. Um and so there's a few that are these funds or people. There's funds here in Utah yeah. that had opportunities that didn't take it, and um, those funds um, they they've already like it's been two quarters, and they'll they'll if they saw the numbers, they'd feel like they made a big mistake. What do you make of that? What do you make of um, Utah's venture community? Mm. Oh man, I got to be. I'm thoughtful about this question. I'm I had gonna... Blake Moderitsky where you are. I'll just give you a sense as you think about it. I had Blake Moderitsky where you are um, just yesterday. Obviously, Pelion, incredible, maybe the most successful investor in the state of oh, Utah. Oh, very successful. With Cloudflare yeah. and Divi. And, yeah. You know, you had so many of these incredible Amazing. wins. Amazing, yeah. And then I had Carrie Barker from Cross Creek, who I think you know. I love Carrie. She was a so Series C investor. Yeah, such such a brilliant, 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 brilliant person. Person like we have, we have like these top tier 
minds and people who've been like really successful and all of the funds here are great, of course, and they're all trying to, you know, um, build the ecosystem. But wh- where do you think we're at in the state of Utah? It's interesting. There's a lot of small funds, a lot more funds than there ever has been before. Um, some of those funds that have soured with entrepreneurs in Utah, I see them expanding outside of Utah quietly instead of saying, hey, we don't have the gravitas we used to have. They're expanding. Um, I do think it's more competitive for them, though, too. Um It's interesting. I do see one thing that I'm surprised by is um, I will see uh, a set of entrepreneurs that I passed on a deal. I when I interview or kind of talk to them in the investment process, I'll see them say things like, um, uh, how do I know when I'm supposed to quit? Or um, just questions that are so far from the mentality of an entrepreneur that's mm-hmm. going to succeed. And then they'll raise money and I'll look back and I'll, I'll see, okay, so I think they raised money and I'll look at the valuation. There's far too many VCs in Utah, in my humble opinion. Um, and I have invested personally in 14 funds and uh, 50 plus deals uh, locally, and and they have happened. I've started investing in those deals. It's been almost eight years, so I've had some time to see how I've been able to do personally. But what I'll see is they'll um, bet on an entrepreneur that I would never bet on, but because their valuation is low, they mm. will. They, they, there's way too much, um, I think, emphasis on how low the valuation is, and I feel like um, if you have an entrepreneur that you feel like no matter what. Is it has a track record of succeeding and will continue to and doesn't let up. Um, even if the valuation is two or three times higher than that other, I would all day as an angel. I, I just think your return is so much sounder. Yeah, there. I mean, more of nothing is nothing. Yeah, I'll see one entrepreneur who's uh, had a few exits raising at thirty million on two million. One that's raising at five, and the one at thirty isn't raising, and the one at five valuation is. And I'm shaking my head, thinking uh, my check's on you all day. Yeah. That thirty, it, it's going to be nothing uh, in the in over five years. So anyway, I think that's one thing that Why do you I think oppose. That's, where do you think that's true? I think some investors are really financially minded and I'm wearing the hat of the entrepreneur. I'm looking mm. for mental toughness. I'm looking for experience. And so maybe maybe in some of my deals, I'll have uh, not quite as high of a return, but I will have a return. Yeah. And I think that over the net of many of my deals, I've been able to seed a lot of deals here locally that, you know, I don't have publicly, but like, you know, I, I was a seed investor in Spiff, right? Mm-hmm. Or uh, I was early in Workfront or I was early. At, there's there's actually quite a few here locally that have exited that I was really early in. Um, and it was just because I love the entrepreneurs that are at work. And so I'll bet on them all day. And I think that some of those returns are great and some are kind of a, a two or three times my money. Yeah. What do you, what are some of your like most important leadership traits that you've learned over the years as a leader? Oh man. One of one of like one thing that you can never get around that I think that will try to get around inevitably is your example is the most powerful form of leadership. And what I mean by that is you'll have an entrepreneur who um, brags about um, the fact that they're working on other businesses um, and they're like building another company or like uh, commonly they'll talk about how they're CEO of five companies Mm -hmm. Um, uh, or they'll, this happens actually quite a bit. Um, They will check out at five and not reply to their team or they they just won't create that kind of momentum by example Mm -hmm. that you have to create. Um, And I think that I see way too often CEOs have to realize at the early stage that you set the momentum, the intensity at which you work sets the tone for the company and there's no way around it. Clint, I wasn't in CEO shape the first six months, I would call it. (laughs) Uh, I just was, uh, and and here's what's funny. Um, Because I was running a big company before, north of 600 million in revenue, I became more of a Zen master and I had to rewire myself to be the CEO. And it was one of very painful process. And then I had to almost undo all that and learn how to be a bit of a fanatic again and be very intense. And it took me six months to actually warm up to being 
that person again. And so that example that I, I have to set as the leader of the organization is that I'm all in and I'm ready to rip and I'm going to do whatever it takes to back my team and they're going to feel it from every angle. They're going to mm-hmm. see me all over making it happen. And I don't think an early CEO can work two and a half days golf and talk about it and then wonder why it doesn't succeed. Yeah, That's just one example of how important it is. You don't have work-life balance. You don't work eight to five. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. You have to be an animal or I wouldn't back that entrepreneur if I'm a VC. If that, if you don't feel like they're going to be a bit of a workaholic and an animal, I, I what I'm saying is probably totally unpopular <laughs> and it probably sounds way better to say that I'm out at five o'clock and I've had this beautifully balanced life. In the back of my head, I'm thinking about work a lot. I've made a lot of sacrifices in my life. Anybody who's that fanatical has other areas of their life that take a hit. Yeah. But you have to be fanatical. If you don't want to do that, don't sign up to be a startup CEO is what I would say is just don't do it. And don't, you know, everybody doesn't have to do it that way that they've chose to be employees. I'm available. Yeah. They don't need to be available at eight o'clock, but I am if they need me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a huge thing. I mean, even if you just put that in any, in any profession, that's true. Like you've got to be fanatical to be like one of the greatest and have great outcomes. If you think about like basketball, you think of Jordan and Kobe and like these people who are just crazy about it, like obsessive about it. And it does affect your uh, other aspects of your life. How do you manage that piece? It's affected. You know, one thing is, is um, being off for a year and a half during that time. It's like I was intensely involved in all these things, and suddenly I'm home, and my wife's just like, I don't need you following me around. <laughs> the handyman doesn't need your help. Like You need to get a life again. And um, I think that she got used to that. I got used to that. But there's sacrifices my wife has definitely had to make because of the intensity of that. One thing that's changed about me that's that's helped a lot in the last couple of years, I wish it would have happened sooner in my life. I... I now will work real fast and live real slow. Mm. So I now, when I'm not working, I am in it with my kids. I And I've started gardening. I've started cooking. I've started collecting albums. I've become a little bit more of a balanced human being. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm not. I'm all in with them. Where before I was always like, I was like 70%, 30% in my head was always spinning on work. Somehow something switched. I don't know if it was enough success that I kind of was like, okay, I don't don't know what happened. I can't actually put my finger on it. But I do now when I'm with my girls playing catch like I was last night, I was just with them. Yeah, You know, I I was in the moment 100% and loved everything about it. And so I think that's one thing that entrepreneurs need to do is even though you're going super hard, when you're not, you got to find that way to downshift and go all in with whatever else you're doing. Otherwise, that ruins the quality of life for your loved ones. What does a typical day look like for you? Um, Like you're in great shape. You're like healthy. Like it's Thank you. So it's not like this is taking an effect on because it does on a lot of folks, right? Like yeah. it takes yeah. an effect on their physical health because you get so obsessed, you like forget literally about everything else. Yeah, that's just kind of wild. It is. It is. I think that um, I see them one and the same. So I see me um, exercising, me uh, meditating, or my my personal fitness. I see that as part of being a great CEO. So instead of seeing it as hey, I'm so fanatical about the business, I don't have time to take care of myself. I see taking care of myself is taking care of the business. And I actually don't just worry about my health, but I worry about my executives. And when mm. I catch when I catch up with them in one-on-ones, I'm asking them, how's your health? How are you doing? What are you doing about this? And we're discussing in detail how they're taking care of their mental and physical health. We have an OKR system or a system to track performance. I see it all the time. I know how they're performing. I know where the low lights are, where their highlights are. That's what my executive meetings for. My one-on-ones are just making sure everybody's healthy in their mindset and they're emotionally, mentally, and physically healthy. So I would say that like a lot of CEOs are talking about their one-on-ones and I'm like, I can check the KPIs. I can, I can pull up the apps. I can check their performance and see how they're doing. 
I know from watching, if you've been a CEO long enough and you attend an executive meeting and they report their numbers, you know what's going on in the business. Mm -hmm. I don't need to take the call to figure that out. I actually think if the CEO is figuring out in the one-on-one how well your department is performing, they're MIA or they're not (laughs) experienced. So my one-on-ones are checking in on their health. I guess my answer, Clint, is I I see that all as one thing to be a high performer. And that was part of in 2016 when my back went out and I was 25 pounds heavier than I am now. I had to go through this kind of painful transition of not just my physical health, but everything thinking, I want to do this for a long time, and I want to be one of the greats. I want to do this on a whole nother level. I want to run a public company. And if if that's going to be something I'm really serious about, I'm going to have to step up every area of my life. Was that hard, or have you found like once you got into the habit, it's become easier? Now I feel way better, and I'm like, man, what was I doing? Because you... When you're out of shape, it's hard on you. It's burdensome. Yeah, it's yeah. it's actually uh, creates a lot of problems for you in other areas where you get aches and pains and hurt and and mentally it weighs on you a bit in a funny way where you're like, man, I'm not where I need to be. Mm-hmm. There's this kind of looming to do in your head to get better. Yeah. And so when you're not, um, it's almost like I I would parallel it to having a lot of debt. You, if you have a lot of debt. You always have that to worry about in the back of your head. If you have a lot of physical debt, you have that to worry about in the back of your head. If you don't have the physical debt or the the financial debt, you, it turns you loose to go absolutely wild. You're pretty free at that point. Yeah, and I feel like um, my habits, my team, and the finances that we have have put me in a position where we can do some serious damage in a way that I've never been able to do. And that's what we're on a mission to do. How have things changed culturally running a business over the past decade, right? Like Mm. all of a sudden, like to give you an example, like ESG was like a really big and important thing in like 2020, 2021. DEI is maybe still as a big thing, but it's like all these things have all of a sudden become like culture topics and political topics and all of this type of stuff. So what's the difference between like uh, 2014 being a CEO and 2024? Like for me, nothing changes. (laughs) <laughs> uh, because I have a certain like North Star and values and my team buys in and I'm real clear with the team. One thing that we have in our handbook is um, we're here to be a profitable, growing enterprise. We're not going to chase every cause that everyone feels strongly about. You're welcome to do that in your time. But we will have a cause that we do focus on, you know, at, at full cast education is going to be a major focus philanthropically. But a lot of different people in the company have their own interests. And mm-hmm. if a CEO is swayed by everyone's interest and they're not clear in that this isn't our mandate, we can't, we can't actually succeed long term without hyper focus, then you have an issue. So I'm just clear up front about that. I also just think that um, I kind of ignore, and I don't know if this is a generational thing, but I ignore what is considered political and not political. Yeah. Because I think that becomes unhealthy from a mindset. Um, For example, uh, I had some situations when I was in Philadelphia and I was being excluded by my teachers because of uh, my faith and religion. Mm -hmm. Um, I sat, and I've told this story, I sat with... Um, they, they, the, my teacher was extremely racist against Asian and black people and hated members of the church of Jesus Christ. He just, it, she'd be in her nineties now and she did not like much. This woman was a tough, she, her name was Miss Launch. And wow. I think a few times my dad was like, man, I want to launch Miss Launch. He'd say funny things to me because I was hurt by what she did. It made me more of a champion for, um, maybe groups or people that get, passed up or don't get equal opportunity. Now, because I have philanthropically supported maybe um, like our family um, supports, last year we supported uh, the uh, Hispanic community and gave a bunch of uh, scholarships for these really intelligent Hispanic high school students to go to college. The year before, we helped with James Jackson create the Black Success Center with Taylor Randall at the U, Mm -hmm. and we got 400 kids from Provo to Salt Lake to leave school 
to Dream Builder University with a bunch of black lawyers, doctors, and CEOs to talk about how they could become and dream whatever they want in life. Now, I was doing those things because of Your experience. my experiences in my life. Yeah. You could look at those things and say, oh, you know, I'm sure there's people that will say, oh, he's woke or he's he's whatever political standpoint because of this. I'm like, no, this is just because this is where my heart is. Uh, I'll give you another example. My kids, they, um, they couldn't have uh, recess sometimes. It was canceled because of air quality issues, right? I mean, I'm like, this, that's a really big deal when my kids can't play. It's canceled mm -hmm. because of air quality issues. Or uh, you come outside in January and I'm like, man, do I really want to recruit an executive to Utah when they can't tell if it's smog or pollution, right? That's a problem. I don't care what side of the, I don't care how you view it politically. Yeah. I just want to breathe clean air. Yeah. And I think before the Olympics, we've got to make sure there's clean air for everybody. So call it what you want. I've just put aside politics and I'm just saying what needs to be done. And more of these things are just being a humanitarian and loving human beings and people and my family, right? Uh, but for some reason, I think some CEOs too will take a political slant. I also don't like the political system, Clint. Like, yeah, exactly. I just think our generation is like, why are you almost like more cultishly aligned to a party and defending a party when both of them are super, you know, they all have major issues. I do think our generation is like, it's, I don't know anyone my age in my friend group or circle who belongs to a party. I actually think See, it's, that's fascinating. it's kind of weird when you bump into someone who's like part of a party. Now I have the crazy brother who's obviously like, you know, one way, um, and that's wild to be around. You're like, what? How is your whole life this? Like, I don't get it. What are you talking about? Like, do you, yeah. you don't know these people? What are you going to do? What are you doing? <laughs> you also kind of lose respect for their opinions. I hate to say it this yeah. way. Because what happens is, is you just want to have a conversation that is third party, non-biased, just like, let's, 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 let's riff on this issue, mm -hmm. right? Whatever it is, like say it's abortion or whatever, like how, how do we, how do we better solve for whatever issue you want to talk about? If they come from the standpoint of, I just want the best solution. You love that conversation. If they come from the standpoint of everything is from a party angle and through that filter, <laughs> even when it makes no sense, you just get to the point and, and it gets old when that same friend, you know that all you have to do is turn on the channel for whatever their political party is and the alignment is 100%. Yeah, they'll just say like the same just thing. Just repeat says. it. Yeah. You, you wonder, you're like, are any of these their own thoughts? And are any of these thoughts more kind of unbiased? Yeah. So that's where I have a hard time with that. Yeah, when so I just I hear the same thing from like 10 different people, I'm like, do you guys get an email, like a memo of like, <laughs> like yeah. what are your actual thoughts on this? Like, this is crazy. Yeah, I wonder how that'll change in Utah because so much of Utah growing up, um, especially being in Springville, everyone was Republican, yeah. right? And it was a big thing to be a Republican. And if you were uh, any other party, it was very, it was almost like the derogatory word. Yeah, it was really like was. you did something wrong, right? I was just the town over in Spanish Fork. It's the same thing. Yeah. And and to me, that is just not right. I don't think that there needs to be this political affiliation and somehow that should be synonymous with any religious faith. I think you should take every issue and try to be practical and smart about it. I'll give you an example of like when we're, we've run into this, Silicon Slopes, even recently. Like recently, uh, I was reading an article and it was about some kid who was, it was about all sorts of things. And like his, he actually ended up dying, but it was about like neglect from his parents and malnutrition. He died of malnutrition, this kid. Oh, wow. But um, anyways, part of the story that really stuck with me was uh, the school lunch lady saw him digging through the trash to eat lunch. And she's like, well, I'm just going to pay for his lunch because he couldn't get lunch because he had negative school balance, like yeah. school lunch balance, yeah. right? So she started paying for his lunch. And then the school district says, you shouldn't do that. It sets a bad example. And other like parents are going to take advantage of school lunch. Like It's going to set a bad example. Other parents will start taking advantage of all that type of stuff. And anyway, that part of the story hit home for me because, you know, again, we kind of go back to our experiences, right? Yeah. Like I was that school lunch kid. Yeah. I was like, I needed yeah. the free I lunch. I the help. I was the summer lunch kid where you like, all right, let's go to yeah. this, like to get like summer. Yeah. Like I was that kid. Yeah. Right. And like, again, that story is about way more than that, but I really fixated on the lunch thing. 
I'm all, so that shouldn't happen. That doesn't make sense. I don't care how it <laughs> gets taken care of. Yeah. But I don't want that to happen. So Silicon Slip says, all right, how is this a problem? I put out like a tweet, right? Yep. I'm like, how, what is this? What's going on? And I learned like we had $2.8 million in school lunch debt in the state of Utah. I'm like, oh, that's a small number. Let's just go raise that. Let's cover right? it. Yeah. So immediately that day, we launch, we start raising money for this thing. And we partner with somebody I'd never even met before. Uh, his name's DJ Bracken, who actually started a foundation just a couple months before called the Utah Student Debt Lunch Relief Foundation or something yeah. like that. And we've we've raised like I don't know twenty twenty five thousand dollars at this point, but it's it's like we're we're gonna fix the issue. So here's what's crazy. That's all it is for me. Yeah, is like all right. How do we fix this issue? Obviously, it's not sustainable for us to do this long term unless you like create a perpetual fund. But then you start asking questions. If we get like two or three years down there, like why are we doing this? Yeah, right. Yeah. But right now, let's just solve the freaking problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And man, the political storm you get in when you do these things it's crazy it's like why do you think you, you do this like isn't that going to again like kind of like the set the bad example thing like parents are going to start taking advantage of this isn't this crazy why isn't this why isn't this like both sides are kind of like attacking it i'm all yes. what i'm all, i don't care yeah like solve the issue like how is the issue going to be solved clint it's like you the kid at school who didn't get lunch is the center of the issue yeah, that's why all that is the tell wagging the dog why is this a political issue? People have to put politics aside and think about people. Humanity is what yeah. matters. It's amazing how brainwashed. Yeah. It's like, you want me to stop making sure this kid doesn't get fed because of some political agenda? You're out of your mind. Get out of my way. We're going to feed these kids. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I think our generation has to put the politics aside and look um, at how do we care for humanity and each other. Well, it's so crazy because, you know, we put that out and they're like, you want the government to, you know, give free lunch to everybody? I'm like, no, we're not the government. Like, this, There's also like misunderstanding like what Silicon Slope says. I feel like people think I'm like an elected official or something. Well, I, I mean, <laughs> like, I, I kind of just do whatever I want. <laughs> I, I think I actually think here. you're in a better spot than they are. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't answer to yeah. anybody. I can yeah. do whatever I want. Exactly. They're like, why are you, uh, you know, Want, advocating for the government. Oh, I'm not advocating for the government. I'm. We're private. All of this is private. I don't care how it gets fixed. How do we fix it? And if the answer is Silicon Slopes creates a perpetual fund, then that's what we'll do. Like, I don't yeah, care. For but sure. like, what is the actual answer? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right? It's crazy. Yeah, it's it wild. Yeah. Anyways, how are you thinking uh, future long-term? Obviously, goal is yeah. to run a public company. Yeah, I think I've thought a lot about legacy. I am thinking big and I am thinking long-term in maybe bigger than I've ever thought. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things. One thing that I want to do that I've been thinking about is I'd eventually like to see some type of leadership summit here in Utah mm -hmm. for leaders from around the world. Um, and I've got some ideas and kind of a grand plan for that. That's something I'd like to see happen. Some type of major event, Davos kind of feel mm -hmm. Uh, here in Utah. I'd love to see that happen. Yeah, that'd be sweet. We have the perfect place for it. I feel like we have it. Um, the company stuff, I think, um, I I view it in so much more than just building a company. I view it as the impact on the community and the people and the lives of all those people. It's also an interesting time in Silicon Slopes. Mm -hmm. If you think about Silicon Slopes, um, some of the founders and the people that have carried Silicon Slopes, you know, Aaron, um, uh, Sconard, has um, retired. You see that Todd Peterson's retired. Mm -hmm. uh, Josh James went away for a while and then came back. Mm -hmm. um, you see Ryan Smith. He's the Smith. only one still running a company. Yeah, Josh and you is. see Ryan Smith leaving. I think that it's time for the next generation of entrepreneurs to start to step up and to build on what they built and to you know, give them a break to raise grandkids and families. And yeah. it's hard and intense. Um, but I think it's time for the next group to step up and build Silicon Slopes. I think there was a bit of a mistake made when, um, you know, maybe like 2017, 2018, where we were really trying to promote this state and in particular promote a lot of the people you just mentioned. Like, look at what they're building. This is crazy. This is really cool. And then the community, like that next generation would see them on stage and like, stop putting them, stop giving them the microphone. 
Yeah. It's like, no, it's not really about them. It's about, you know, we got to, yeah. what are we at? We got to like, it was a way to promote the brand. We got to spike the football. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> what, what are we doing? We've got to spike the football. And then it, there became, it kind of became like this kind of like, there's this wing of the community that becomes like kind of antagonistic to that and feels like, For well, sure. now we need to like go against that. For sure. And do something. And I think we made a bit of a mistake there as a community that we need to rectify, which I think it's easily rectified, but where we just kind of put all of that stuff behind us. And it's like, well, everybody, let's just step up. Like it's, it really is only about spiking the football when you're doing like community building. Yeah, Whoever's that, got the football, who cares? Whoever gets to spike it, as long as we score. For sure. And, and I think that this generation can be a much wider net of entrepreneurs. It should be a it's larger bigger. group. It's larger it group. Be bigger. It's far more diverse. It's far more everything. Yes. And I think that that's kind of the next thing is just a lot of entrepreneurs and maybe by committee uh, success. Mm -hmm. And I, I could see us, you know, getting national kind of recognition through just sheer numbers versus, you mm -hmm. know, lifting a certain sum of individuals. And it's such a rare thing what Utah is able to do. Like the fact that all of those leaders, we could get them in a room to talk about not their companies, but about growing the ecosystem and growing Utah. It's so rare. Like when we were doing it in like 2018, 2019, Forbes like put it on the cover of their magazine. They're like, what is going on? Like yeah. the top CEOs in the state are just getting together and they don't even talk about their companies. They just like figure out how they can grow other companies and other, like it's crazy. Yeah, there is a- It's pretty rare. Yeah, there's a unique dynamic in Utah that I love. It's one of the major reasons I love being a Utah is that people, and I actually think that um, this may be an unpopular thing to say, but I think because of um, the undertones of the religious, when you're giving away 10%, whether people think it's to the right cause or not, you're in the habit of mm -hmm. giving. You're in the habit of taking a portion, a big portion, and giving it away, and the mentality that comes with that. If you're not even religious, you have to respect the mentality because that fights greed, that creates opportunity for other people. And you start out with a mindset where you're you're putting aside and giving away money from a young age. And I think we're used to giving away money and time in Utah from a very young age. And it sets the tone and a feeling that is different than most places. Yeah, this is another mistake we're making right now related to the one we just did. Um, but it's as a state, not as a community. And that is, I, I, I saw a tweet maybe like a month ago where it was like, 65% of the state is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's too high. That's like, we need to like get that lower. Yeah. And I was like, the what? Like, what does that, what does that mean? Like, yeah. how? Like, my initial thing is like, how do you do that? You want to like put, relocate? People, like, what are we yeah. talking about that? It gets like pretty wild pretty quick when it, you actually like think of like, we want to reduce the population of a certain religion in an area. Yeah, I mean, I... You know how I, crazy that is? It is. <laughs> you start looking at some crazy things in history where that's happening, or, or where that's... Ha I mean, you look at Israel right now, right? Like, these these are, like, consequential things that you're just throwing out there to try to, like, make a point or get a few likes on social media. Like, that is wild. And we've got to respect and spike the football on, like, what came before us, and why would we not respect it? Why would we want less? Yeah. That's you know, crazy. I have so many friends because I live in Salt Lake kind of proper um, in an area that is predominantly people that have moved in and majority of people are not a part of the Church of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And I live in the heart of all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I think is very interesting is they're very respectful about what came before and how we got to where we are. And the other thing is, is they love it here. They love it. And, and people that come kicking and screaming, six months later, I mean, my next door neighbor is Laurie Markinen. And Laurie is in love with Utah. He comes back from hikes in the mountains. He told me uh, he told me at one point that he didn't want to go back to Finland. He wanted to just stay the summer in Salt Lake with his kids and fam. He's rolling under cars with Nerf guns, shooting with my kids. <laughs> he is like, he's like, man, I can get to the city in a minute. I can get to the freeway in 15 minutes. I can get to Park to City in 25 minutes. I'm downtown. I love the, I love, he, he loves working out in the mountains. Mm -hmm. He loves the family focus. If these people that come in, and for a long time, I think that um, we had a bad rap where people would say free agents, people don't want to come for the jazz. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my, my whole thing, if I were Ryan Smith, is 
let him just be here for six months Mm -hmm. and people will change their minds. The culinary side of Salt Lake City over the last 10 years, transformational, major difference. Uh, I, I just think that where else in the world can you be in the city and in 10 minutes, I'm by myself on a hiking trail in the mountains. In 10 minutes. Utah is literally what that. everybody thinks Colorado is. Salt Lake is literally what everybody thinks Denver is. Pretty remarkable. And my only message there is like, don't attack what has made us unique and it has created that, what you just described. For sure. Like, let's, like, like sure, like, critiques are great, but like, yeah. less? That's wild. It, or yeah. more is wild. Or like, any of it is like, what are you talking about? This is weird. Well, if I'm looking from the outside in, There's a lot of things. One that I could see that would help overall, what I just talked about with tithing. I think it's good. It makes us Mm -hmm. generous people. Another thing that I think is look at the the missionary program and and everything that that entails. That's created some incredible entrepreneurs and a lot of great salespeople. And at the end of the day, what makes business go around? You know, salespeople are critical Mm -hmm. to businesses. There's all these things that if you're not even religious, you have to look at and say, yeah, there's some really positive things that have contributed to what makes Utah great. And I think I think that we also, the diversity and the people coming from outside of Utah are making Utah even better it's fantastic. too. Yeah. It's, a, it's amazing because I've just found that with my teams, the more diversity, the better place we get, the more different types of thought. I make better decisions. We make better decisions. And so I think if we just collaborate and see each other as a win-win, that's how Utah goes forward. Yeah. There doesn't need to be, it's just like the political stuff. There doesn't need to be, hey, there's less of this faith or there's more people. It's not about that. We're all Utahns yeah. and we're all trying to do and it, it, do great things. Let's enjoy a great economy. Let's enjoy the spirit of generosity. Let's enjoy the fact that in Utah, we can be in the outdoors and we can eat well and have the the kind of spirit of family and togetherness. Those are the things we should celebrate and just keep those values going in Utah. Final question. We believe the chances one gives is just as important as the chances one takes. When you hear that, who gave you a chance to get you to where you are today? My grandfather. Yeah. Yeah, my grandfather. Being in the farm truck with my grandfather. There's nothing like that. I have to, yeah. That's my exact same answer. Yep. Brian, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, brother.